Are you ready to join the sisterhood? This is the Freedom Sisters Podcast, a place where sisters in service gather to talk about the journey of life and faith, from hardships to victories, and everything in between. Hey, 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 it's Monday. I hope you find yourself in a joyful spot this week. But let me tell you what, if not, I'm hopeful that this conversation will start that joyful journey for you. Maria Mia Salazar is a Marine Corps veteran. She's an artist and specifically she works with clay. She started a nonprofit to help other veterans regain their sense of self and in doing work with clay. It really reminds me of like Jesus and God being our potter and how he shapes us and molds us. Well, when you dig your hands into this clay and she goes into deep detail about what it does to the sensory evolution of who we are as humans and how it reconnects us to our inner selves and our external selves and all the things, it really is so powerful. So I'm really proud of her. I'm proud of her for her service. I'm proud of her for the amazing mom she is, and just her heart and her vision to help other veterans heal from their trauma. We deep dive into post-traumatic growth. Y'all, that's so important because we are more than what has happened to us. And you you need to feel what you're feeling and then figure out a way to heal. And that's what we talk about today. So I hope this brings you much joy. I hope this helps you in your journey to healing. So listen in and let me know what you thought about today's episode. Head us up on Facebook or Instagram. We're easy to find Freedom Sisters Podcast. Well, today I am so excited to invite Mia Salazar to the show. Mia, thank you for being here. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. You're welcome. So sisters, we are in for quite a treat. I'm really excited about Mia. She's an artist and a veteran, and I just think some of the work she is doing is pretty incredible. Mia, can you give us a bit more information about yourself for listeners that may not know you? Yes. um, So um, my name is Maria. I served in the Marine Corps for nine years. Um, I deployed to Iraq in um, OIF-03. Um, when I got out, I, uh, you know, tried to find my place. I was an, a fitness instructor. Then I, um, I had our, my twins, and then I became a stay-at-home mom. And I, um, I had to, you know, battle, like, postpartum depression and stuff like that. And then I went back to school for art therapy, and I found clay in one of my classes and I feel like working with clay has completely changed my life um it's given me purpose again and a mission and um I just want to share it with people now you know that there's a possibility for post-traumatic growth through creativity (laughs) that's about it (laughs) yeah I love that I love that even in your introduction, there are so many transitions that you've experienced in life. And all of my women who come on the show are veterans. And so you served in the Marine Corps. Can you tell us a bit more about your time in the Marine Corps? Yeah. So I, um, I went in when I was, it was, I went in right after 9-11 actually. And because of 9-11, um, I came from Peru when I was 12 because the terrorism in my country was really bad. And my dad was um, a police officer there. So they were targeting, you know, police officers. So when we came here, um, it was kind of like a safe, you know, be new beginning for us. So when 9-11 happened, I, I just brought back so many memories of growing up in Peru, on, you know, with like terrorism. And I feel like this time I was old enough to be able to protect my family and like my new country. So I joined the Marine Corps. Um, I got deployed to Iraq in 2003. Um, and then I, I served in six motor transit battalion as a logistics specialist. Um, basically, what we had to do is I just um, I had to keep the combat readiness, um, you know, report to, to Marine Corps headquarters. Um, what else? Um, I mean, my, my time in, in 
I, I'm very proud of my service. It was a good, one of my, the best decisions in my life. And I still try to carry it through. Um, you know, I, I was a single mom when I had my first daughter. Um, I had her after, the year after I came from Iraq. So that weighted heavily on me staying longer uh, because I was up for re, um, re up my contract when my daughter was going to be going to kindergarten. But I, I was also on rotation to get sent to Afghanistan. And um, I was talking to her one day because, you know, being a single mom, I, I have a really open, you know, ways of communicating with her. So we were talking and I asked her, I'm like, what do you think your mommy stays in the Marine Corps? And she's like, you know, but they'll send you away. And I was like, yeah, but they always, you know, I always come back, you know. And then she said, but what if you get killed? So when my five year old asked me that question, it was like, that's it. You know, I I put in my time. I did nine years. I, I can't do this to her. So that's that was it and then yeah that's oh that's beautiful I love that I was a single mom too when I served and there's no other way but to communicate really openly and honestly yeah kids especially in that kind of environment because it's it's important and the work we do is important in the military but our job motherhood is like the utmost importance and so I think that's really awesome that you included her in that conversation and and then took her lead, you know, to make sure that mommy was going to be there for her. Um, I think the service that you did, you, you said, I, I did my time. You did nine years. I mean, that's nine years more than 99% of the rest of the population. So um, that's pretty fantastic. I want to talk about your time in Iraq because in 2003, that was the line of departure. So um, I have another girlfriend who has been on here, Jody Grenier, and she was in the Intel world and she was there at that time too. What, what month did you deploy? I was there actually at the beginning, the kickoff. Um, yeah. We we got deployed at the beginning of 2003. So like January, you know, we went to Camp Pendleton. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sorry. And no, you yeah, were so, in a holding pattern in Kuwait for some time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we like deployed. We were in Kuwait kind of just waiting for things to kick off, you know, like we were PTing and rocking and just getting all the, you know, the gear ready. Um, and then I remember the war officially started on a Thursday night, like, you know, missiles being, you know, thrown at us. And, um, and I, it, it just so happens that we, my battalion was a reservist battalion. So we got attached to an active duty uh, battalion. Um, the, um, they're, they're called landing support um, group out of uh, Camp Pendleton. They're called Red Patchers. And I got pulled out of my company and got attached to theirs so I when we crossed over to Iraq like the war started on a Thursday night I was in the advance party on Saturday night with a whole new company that I didn't know I was the only female of 65 males um and I remember one of the new sergeants because I I was new to this company when you know he called off the roster he was like oh it was nice knowing you you know like assuming I'm gonna get killed or whatever I was like please mother effer so then I, I saw him like maybe four months after when, cause you know, cause we all got sent everywhere. Um, I got pushed forward and to kind of basically set up camp for the main body to come in. Mm-hmm. So, and we, uh, our, our battalion, our, our main job was doing convoys. So we would drive for, you know, weeks on end, going back to Doha, to Kuwait, picking up supplies. And then we would push up North, catch up to the infantry, um, uh, you know, companies that needed their, their supply um, replenished. So in one of these going back and forth, I found him again. I was like, hey, Sergeant, guess what? I'm still alive. You know? And then he was like, uh. Yeah. But, Jerk. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I was like, I can't curse, but I wanted to curse. I'm like, mother effort. <laughs> yeah, totally. I, I think that's really incredible. One of 65. Like that's a crazy. Yeah. So how was that experience? And and I want to know about the combat readiness too, because at the beginning of the war, I don't think we were completely prepared. We are. I want to hear about that. But what was it like, and what did you learn about yourself and God in being the only woman in that group and of so, on? Yeah. So it was. I mean, I think it's like my. I I'm very adaptable. Like my personality is like a kind of mold. Um. I, you know, I've had to survive since I was a little kid. So like, I just kind of mold myself to situations, but so I was the only girl. So that meant that back then we had these like two men tent, like the igloo looking things. 
Um, but because I was the only female, I had my own tent. So that was like a plus because they were sharing one themselves. Um, but I just, I just made it in myself that like, I'm going to carry my own weight. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to be like, like the helpless, you know, female that they got stuck with, you know? I was just, I just molded myself to be like, hey, we got to do this, you know? Like, and a lot of times when we were in the convoys, um, I, uh, my job over there was kind of hard to do because we have to do like parts procurement. Like say uh, if a truck breaks down, like I have to order parts to make sure that the trucks get, you know, uh, fixed in, in a quick, in a fast time. That's part of having all of our equipment combat ready. So like rifles, um, you know, we had all these, um, trucks um so at the beginning we really didn't have like computers set up so i really couldn't do my job you know um because i'm like the liaison between the mechanics and the supply department so i'm always kind of like hey guys where's this part i need it for this truck and you know so the computers weren't really working back then so i was always volunteering for convoy security so um uh, uh, and then somehow I always got stuck in the, in the security vehicle. And then the rules of engagement at the time were that, you know, if a convoy is going and one of the trucks breaks down, you pull over to the side and the convoy keeps going. Like, you know, we're not going to stop for you. The rear vehicle, our job was to stop and pick up everybody, you know, and then the whole ass to catch up. So somehow I always got stuck on that, on that one. And I remember this one time, oh, we had a navy a navy uh, chaplain on one of the the trucks and their Humvee broke down so i um she was a little bit of he like heavy set you know and we had a 7 ton it was like one of those um high you know trucks or whatever so like mm -hmm. i i jumped off the thing like i jumped off the back of the truck to help her up cuz she couldn't climb up and you know like marines the marines are making like you know comments and stuff and i just got so annoyed i mean like she was older you know she was heavier set like i don't know i just wanted to prove them that you know not all, all females can be like that way sort of you know mm -hmm. um so that was the one thing that stuck with me that i it, i was annoyed that they were making fun of her so but and they didn't offer help i mean to help exactly her. No, well yeah and that's so, like, like we, go ahead no 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 yeah so it was like they were kind of like you know cracking jokes and then but i'm like but but what's the point like so help jump out get her stuff you know get her on the truck and then we out like yeah so. and the sooner you do that the safer you are exactly but exactly um, you know her job in and marines don't have chaplains right it's all Navy. no so Navy. yeah she was already outside of her comfort zone and all of that anyway, but she was still doing a job that was needed because exactly. everyone needs. And she and you could tell that she was so mortified. You know what I mean? She that was she was like, heavy or that she was Well, I think all of it, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, she was you know, I was twenty two at the time when I deployed. So I was young, you know. And she must have been in her fifties, late fifties, you know. So the weather in Iraq is brutal. It's like, you know, even a young person, it, it, it kills you. Like you're, too, you get so dehydrated, you know, the sun hits you, like mm -hmm. you need to be like physically strong, you know? And then you could tell that she was already like very, um, at, you know, I mean, she was out of shape obviously, but I don't know. I, I just felt bad because she was mortified. She was I'm like, already yeah, beaten down because not only just her weight, but just the environment and exactly. all of the things. And not everybody's body is the same. You don't absorb water the same. You don't break your metabolism the same. You don't keep your body temperature the same. And especially being in 50s, she's probably hitting what's hitting menopause and all the other natural things that happen exactly. in the body. Exactly. Uh, so the thing that, that comes to mind when you're talking about this is how the military culture and how they don't embrace women who serve and this is just one of many examples of us as women you know you were a marine darn it you were like in it you knew what you were supposed to be doing and that's how you viewed yourself but that's not how they viewed you with his comment of like oh see you yeah like, whatever his comment like, it was nice knowing you yeah yeah nice knowing you sidebar like backhanded exactly below. like you're <laughs> it's funny because like 
I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. And sometimes it's really hard for me to not cuss, especially you know, as <laughs> trying to represent, a, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's what I was like wait I want to do it but I'm like totally but I like (laughs) you know it goes hand in hand and like even with I mean I want to ask you too with this whole with the Vanessa Guillen thing in the army and her going missing being murdered and nobody taking any action in the army department of defense they they her leadership did her incredibly wrong but like as a minority like you're a double you're a double disadvantage. You're a minority and you're a woman. And so how was that experience? And do you think it was harder to if something, you know, you disagreed with, do you think it was harder? There were more barriers for you to speak up or because you're like a no nonsense kind of person that didn't matter, but you were 22. So Vanessa died at 20. So you're not too far off in your age and your maturity. So can you kind of help shape the conversation for like what it's like to be a woman and a minority in a male dominated world for people who don't know? Yeah. I think, I think especially when you go in the military that young, um, it's really hard to find your voice, you know, because it's it's almost like you kind of shut yourself down, like, because you want to fit in so that you're not part of, you know, the stigma of, oh, this female is too loud or she complains all the time or, you know, so you just kind of like, I'm just going to pick up my backpack and I'm going to do it. You know what I mean? Um, especially when you're like that young you're lower rank so and then in the marine corps there's this like mentality where like if a female is too spoken then you know she's just being like belligerent or you know like she's she's being hysterical or whatever right so um and, and they kind of push that strong silent type you know stigma at you so like I think I molded myself to that I always try to just kind of be you know on the skirts of things Mm -hmm. you know just get my job done like not give them any reason to doubt me or um you know say that that you know I'm not becoming of a marine you know right um but there were a lot of times where I I felt that you're put in a situation because you are a young female, you know, a minority female. Um, and I mean, like, and, and, and now, now that I'm older and I go back and I think about this stuff and I'm like, what the hell? Why, like, why would you let them do that? You know, like put yourself in, in, in situations where you can, you know, possibly get hurt or, 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 or start you, people talking about you, you know? Yeah. Did you feel disposable? Cause that's like a, the older I get, it's almost like, oh, let's put them. I've, I've seen it even in leadership. Let's put them in women in this because it's not important. And it's yeah. almost like, oh, they're disposable or we need just a bunch of bodies. So, oh, what women are not, are available. Right. Them, you know, right. right, right. That's, like that's space fillers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's the one thing I think that irritates me the most because like we never had to be drafted. And even in Vietnam, women were still signing up to serve when our men were being drafted. And it's like, at what point are you going to recognize the valor of the character of the person who's coming in? That doesn't matter my gender because not right. all men can do infantry either. Like, let's just, exactly. not all men have it in them to be that we're all trained killers first. Like not all men even have that capability. So it's like, it just blows my mind the the spy maldedness and the in the culture mindset um it's just it's flabbergasting right and then like especially super, for us go ahead yeah like especially in the marine corps like it's like the mentality is very like our culture is so different i think than other branches um like as a marine as a female marine you either get put into like the the hoe category or like the bitch category you know what I mean so like there's no in between like and then obviously you don't want to be called a walking mattress so you become the bitch you know what I mean mm-hmm. so then you have to kill off a big part of your personality to to fit into that um little box that they have you know yeah and I'm sorry I cursed I just no, realized. that's totally fine and that's the like <laughs> same three categories well we had three in the army so you're bitch a hoe or a, a lesbian like oh those yeah. were the three for us. So I, I think there's a lot of similarities in that because you do, you, there's the women beyond the uniform or under the uniform does really get suppressed because you don't, 
Like you do one thing, flirt with one person, date one person, and that falls apart, yeah. then guess what? You're already, they already assume like you're just going to be ready for the next one. And it, that's not necessarily how it works. Some women can date yeah. really frequently and others aren't like that. It just is a personality driven thing, but you're not just three things. You're multiple, multiple different. Um, yeah. yeah. We had that too. in the army is super frustrating. So I always took the, uh, the bitch route too. Like it was just easier and then nobody really messed with me. And then especially after I became a believer, like a really strong believer and had a good relationship with Jesus and it's like um, healing all of those wounds of my childhood and divorce and other things that were going on in my personal life, then nobody really messed with me at all. It was just different. It was like the joke stopped. It was, it was really nice. It was like, oh, okay, well, and I also had rank and I think that plays. Yeah, I think, in it. I think that makes a difference. I think I as I picked up rank, I was, I carried myself differently, you know, like when I was younger, like, well, younger in time and grade, um, I was just pretty kind of like easygoing and, you know, trying to just do my job and that was it. But as I picked up rank, I tried to mentor other female Marines, how to carry themselves so that they don't become, you know, like alienator at the butt of the jokes, you know, mm -hmm. I tried to be the like female mentor I needed when I was coming up the ranks, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. My only um, interaction with Marines was that um, PAO school. And then when we were deployed, you know, they'd come in on their big missions into Kuwait to like rest, recuperate and all the things. And then they'd go back out. But I was sitting in a coffee shop, which is like super, whatever bougie for <laughs> deployment environment anyway but I was sitting there because the internet was better there my job as a public affairs was to upload files and communicate with the media and all of that and so I worked better at that shop because the internet was better there and these younger marines like I don't know your ranking system but younger were in there and hanging out and stuff which was totally fine and legal and fine and then these sergeants came in and the gunny sergeant was just like totally degrading and belittling these and like shove their faces and all kinds of just gross stuff. And I was like, I am so glad that people don't do that in the army. Like it, the mentality of you are like literally just, I don't even know if jarhead is like a, a good term, but it's like, they just treat you just like this. It was yeah. gross. It was disgusting. And I was like, how is that even appropriate? You guys are supposed to be like the elite of the elite, like, you know, the proud, the few, but you're treating them like shit. And they already are not recruits. They're already like full service members and things. And so it just, I didn't like that. I didn't like it at all. And I was like, oh, I'm so glad I'm not a Marine. I compare that to like generational trauma, how like, you know, you're raised in a certain environment. So when you have to bring up your own kids and you don't break the chain, you're gonna bring them up the same way, you know? It's the same way in the Marine Corps because that's how they were trained to come up, you know? They make you feel like you have to be obedient, you know, to orders and then you can't complain, you can't say anything back and like, and if you do, then you're not, you know, a proper Marine. You know, like if you speak up, if you say anything, like, you know, you're being belligerent. So that's, that's the mentality that, you know, um, and, and, and I think, and it's like the older generation Marines are, are, are harder with that. Like they'll treat you like that. They like yell at you and like scream at you for everything. And I mean, and I have, I'm kind of like in mixed emotions about that because I, I feel like you have to have a thick skin to be in the military to begin with, yes. you know? So you can't be like too sensitive about like, oh my God, he yelled at me, like get over it. But on that, on the flip coin of that, there's no reason why you need to belittle people to get them to obey you. You know what I'm saying? Like fear mm. does not equal respect, you know? Ooh, um, that's good. That's real good. Yeah. And like I had a first sergeant who, man, I... Pfft, like my whole company loved this man. Like he, he inspires so much respect out of our entire, entire company. And not once did he belittle you. He didn't like, you know, make you feel like you were a maggot, you know, like if you screwed up, he pulled you over and like, you were a parade rest getting your, you know, your ass shit out, but he didn't make you feel like you were less of a human. You know, it was more like, I know you better. I know you can do better. 
you know, why are you not up to par, you know? And I think those different types of leadership styles make a huge difference and it affects the whole like culture as a whole, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like, I wish we could somehow indoctrinate that leadership style and change the pervasive style that, you know, is amplified over good leadership over and over and over. I loved what you said earlier. Thank you for sharing your journey in the Marines and just you just so good. Um, and I'm so proud of your service and you just like (laughs) doing it, pulling up the bootstraps girl and just getting it. Um, (laughs) but I loved how you said earlier, like you're just, you're going to mold to, um, your environment, you're going to adapt. And I think that's really beautiful in connection to how you relate to clay and what you're doing post-service. So you are the founder of clay more vets and Mm -hmm. tell us what that is and why, why you felt the the calling on your life to start that. Yeah. So like I said, like, um, I went, I went, well, I went back to school for art therapy, right? Because I've always been an artist my entire life. Um, I instinctively have used art for me to cope with just life difficulties. So I knew that one, when one of one, I, one of my corporals, um, I lost him to suicide and none of us knew that he was feeling any kind of way. So that was kind of like a, a catalyst for me to go back to school, you know, to, to, to help him. But then during school, um, one of my um, courses was ceramics and when I touched that clay, I felt like, I felt like I found the, the piece that was missing to me, you know, like all these years I've had this like hole in my chest that I don't know how to fill it out or yeah, like I don't know how to fill it out. And then when I, when I work with clay, it just becomes like a meditation for me. Like the sensory input I get from just your, like your hands touching the wet clay, you know, the smell of it. Um, even just the, the ability to create a 3D piece out of nothing, mm-hmm. you know? Like, it makes me feel like, you know, like you can mold anything into your, in your life, you know? Like a thought becomes a real tangible thing that you can hold and everyone can see. Um, so I, uh, I, I battled with like PTSD undiagnosed because at the time when I was in the Marine Corps, our mentality was like, suck it up. You know, like yeah. we, we didn't have any like mental health, um, you know, awareness or, or advocacy. Mm-hmm. So a lot of time, a lot of us that came back, even when we came back from our, our deployment and we're doing our, you know, medical checkout. They literally told us, like, don't say anything because they're going to keep you here, you know? Yes. So you've been in, like, deployment for eight months, you know? You're going to be like, hell no, I want to go home. So when you get your psych eval, they ask you, and you're like, no, I'm good. I'm straight, you know? Even though you're, you might be experiencing some things, you never really talk about it. And so I think, like, most of us do if we suck it up, you know? Like, you just, like you said, you put on your boots and just keep going. So it wasn't until the birth of my twins that um, I really f- battled with postpartum depression. And, and even then, I mean, like, I've never been good at asking for help, you know? So every time I felt like, of course, you're going to be tired. You have twin, you know, infants to take care of, you know? Like, if I just start crying out of no reason, it's like, I was always making up excuses for how I was feeling, you know? And at the end, I was like, well, you have to hold yourself accountable because you're not doing these things. And you know what I mean? Um, I was able to process all of these traumas. Uh, when I did, I, I, I had my senior exhibit um, last year and um, I was able to like sculpt like it was like a solo exhibit show. And um, I think I instinctively kind of molded my life through, you know, through each piece. And as I was creating each sculpture, I was able to like process each trauma, even from my childhood, you know, like being an immigrant girl here, um, 
feeling out of place, you know, because I was I didn't speak English, and at the time, I mean, even even now, but at the time, like Im- immigrants weren't really like welcome, so like I was always getting, you know, pushed at school. So like just traumas, and then I, I was able to see that with the work of of, of Clay, I didn't have to talk about it. You know, I just had to like mold it. And then once I saw it in front of me and, and, and I act like existence and actuality, like it was kind of like looking at the mirror, but it was like me looking at my traumas and being able to realize like, okay, this is how it affected me. But now I can see them from across the yard and I can talk about it without it creating pain, you know, where I've never been able to, to talk about things. Um, I'm always like, um, I always hold everything inside, you know? And it wasn't until I was able to work with Clay to form it and put it in front of me that I was able to like, huh, that's what I was feeling. You know what I mean? Yeah, it gave you a tangible, like you said, a tangible thing to the feelings that you were feeling. Right. And it's beautiful. Like your work is beautiful. I love, like the first thing you see when you open up your website is a pair of boots with um, the reeds coming out of it and the, the butterfly. Are the reeds, is that a mixed media or are those clay also? No, this is, that's a mixed media. Yeah. yeah. But the boots are amazing. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And I've seen some of your other work um, is the, the womb, the mom. The womb. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. It's like, yeah, it is so good. And you could see just the beauty in it and the detail of your work is really incredible. So I'm really, um, everyone, you got to go check out her website and her Facebook and Instagram. So how can people find you? Uh, well, we have the web, the website for the, uh, the nonprofit is, uh, claymorevets.org. Um, we were actually like in the in the beginning stages. We were setting up. We were working our contracts with the school, and then coronavirus hit. So we've kind of you know had to put a pause on that because the school is not open right now, so mm-hmm. we don't have access to the studio. Um, but yeah, so once we you know we got everything rolling again, um, we'll be able to 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 accept new you know veterans and stuff. Um, we also do mobile mobile workshops where I go to people's venues and then I you know we, we work with clay um what um yeah but then so they can find us on on Instagram too and your handle is just claymore vets is that right yes yeah mm-hmm. and let's talk about the nonprofit. so what you are an alternate therapy so this is mental health therapy right for healing are you so tell us about the alternate non-traditional yeah that you are so doing the the thing, the thing, even though I, I have an art therapy degree, um, I can't do any clinical work with the veterans as of right now, because you need to get a license, you know, in the state of New York. So when we work with clay, we're not doing any clinical work. So we're not doing therapy. We're not doing diagnostics. We're not doing any type of like treatment, um, goals or anything like that. It's just basically, us introducing the veterans to clay as a medium of expression, you know, it's just mm, like for me, yeah. you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's, and it's, it's very sensory, um, um, de- demanding. So because clay is such a demanding medium, like the first 10 minutes that you start working with it, your thoughts completely go out the window and you're like in it, you're in the flow. You're like, you know, engulfed because it's and hard at first and you have to really work at to right to right it. yeah and and it's because like it's solid and then you have to your coordination has to take in place because then you have to put the right amount of water um and then you know i'm gonna get a little bit clinical about this but so when one of the first things that we do as humans is that we learn our whole world through our touch you know when you're a baby you learn your mother's you know face through touching her um, you know, what's hot and what's cold, you know, through touch. So, um, subconsciously when you're working with clay, um, you are kind of relearning how to navigate your emotions. So that's why, um, a lot of people that start working with clay feel like they're able to open a door, you know, into how, um, they're feeling like it's, 
it's 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 when you talk about it it kind of, it kind of sounds like all like hippie-ish you know but like <laughs> unless you're really fine yeah <laughs> be <Unless> hippie you're, <laughs> but when you're in it when you're working it's like I've had some of the most like deepest conversations when you're at a studio working with clay you know yeah. because your your physically your body gets committed to the clay so your mind kind of kind of levels out and then you're able to quiet the noise you know how you're always thinking like you you're, you're thinking of a million things at one time you know like i didn't do this i have to do this oh my god i forgot this and you know but when you're working with clay it's like everything just shuts off and all of a sudden like you get a clear conversation you know and then you start having a a, a almost like a meditation with yourself and um, that calmness gets you to like kind of clean up the clutter and you put all your thoughts into like those respective boxes you know Mm -hmm. Um, it's almost like as you're explaining to me it's like you're forced to be present you're forced exactly let go of the other thoughts and things because you are you need to focus and be in the present and that is a calming and that is very centering and then relearning like you're physically learning a new skill through touch which is our primary um, one of our primary resources of teaching us all of the things about the world around us. And so you're almost like reteaching yourself, right? Um, recentering, refocusing, and then you can make the thing the way you want it to be. Yeah. And then it's just like, and then how profound is that? Take me back to my trauma. Then when I see that I can make this thought into what I want it to be, now take me back to my trauma so I could look at it through the way that I need it to be. You know, right. I think it's pe- very powerful. And then there's another um, aspect that is, is huge for me, especially because like for veterans, the first thing that you are taught in basic or boot camp is to disconnect your human side, your emotions, you know, like they disconnect you, they cut you off from any feeling because they got to build you up to be a killing machine. You know, you can't feel remorse for killing somebody. You can't feel remorse, for, you know, for, for blowing up somebody or, or, you know, so they cut that off from you. So when you come back into the civilian world, it is very hard to reconnect to that side of you, to reconnect to your humanity, to your emotions, you know, because you're seen as soft if you are connected to emotions in the military, you know? So for me, Clay gives you that aided um, reconnection, you know, to your emotionality without forcing it, mm-hmm. you know? And it's also because like clay, it's like a very sensual material. Um, so your body just responds to it without, because there's a lot of people that have a hard time with like physical, you know, reconnection, you know? Yes. But the clay, it's a bridge to it, you know? Mm-hmm. It's, and even the medium where it starts like that hard facade and you just keep working it, yeah. And just like, you know, the transition of it's hard. And then when you just keep working it and reconnecting to it, you can become what you want to be after service, but it's that constant working and molding to who you want to become. And so there's so many levels. Of, symbolisms. Yeah. yeah. Symbolisms of what the clay is doing for, for your, for your people, for veterans, especially. And I always like this too. We don't hear a whole lot about post-traumatic growth. We hear a lot about the post-traumatic stress disorder and, and then almost in the media, it becomes an excuse to behave any way you want to behave or it becomes the excuse for why somebody is a double homicide, right? Or why somebody did a homicide, uh, suicide, homicide, suicide. Yeah. Um, situation. Oh, well they had PTSD. Oh, it's almost like we're giving an excuse when there's the opportunity to also have growth from your trauma. So can you talk a bit more about that? Cause that's a really big thing that you're. Having. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think, like you said, you know, it's like, I think it's become a stereotype of here's your, here's your PTSD car, go act crazy. You know what I mean? It's like, and you can't like, you still have to hold yourself accountable. You know, you are still, responsible to your family you're so responsible to society like to yourself so just because you're dealing with you know the trauma and and the nightmares and the pain and everything you know it's kind of it's kind of like 
well, I feel like you come into the world by yourself, you know, and you have to like carry yourself through life on your own. So you, you have to be active in your healing, you know, you can't spend, you can't expect someone to be like, oh, it's okay. Let me, let me carry you through. You could lean on someone, you know, you can lean in on hands, but you have to do the walk yourself, you know? So, um, I think it's okay to be in the feelings, experience the moments, the, 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 you know, when you're in your lowest, but then when you're done sitting in those emotions, you know, like you kind of wipe your tears off and like you get up and like, all right, you know, how am I going to do to, to, to climb out of this? You know, I think that's beautiful. I think that's really good advice because absolutely feel the things you can't heal from things that you don't experience. So if you don't allow yourself to grieve or feel the sadness about the experience or be angry about the experience or be happy about an experience even, right, then you'll never be able to process that and move forward and how to stand back up. So I think that's really important. And I love how you said you have to be actively present in your walk. You can't you can't have somebody else can't do it for you. And that's the growth piece. That's the, that's the finding the purpose in the pain. That's the beauty in the ashes. All of those things, whatever resonates with you is the person who's experienced the trauma to walk through that emotion to get to the other side. And it doesn't mean that you forget about it. It doesn't mean that it doesn't affect you. It just means that you've learned new things. And and art is a beautiful coping mechanism. So when you're feeling something, you go to your art so you can let it out and express yourself in a safe place, in a good medium, instead of, you know, drugs, alcohol, using your body, all the other, there's a bajillion negative coping mechanisms too. But in the growth process, you're not... um, re-traumatizing yourself in the growth process. Whereas in the other coping mechanisms and staying stuck, you're re-traumatizing yourself almost yeah. because you you aren't feeling the things and then learning from them. So I just, and I, I'm, a, I'm a creative. So let's just put that out there. I love art. I love writing. I love doing what we're doing and having a conversation about it because there's so much empowerment. Like it's like, whoa, I did that. Oh, the, like my logo. Oh, I created that. That's amazing. You know, like it gives you the sense of like empowerment that you can do anything you put your mind to. Yeah. What drives you to inspire others? Um, hmm. uh, like I said, like, I think a lot of times, um, I don't know if this is just my personality, but I'm very like, I bottle everything up, you know? And it's hard to carry on things like that because you feel so lonely. And um, I think I want to be able to give people the ability to feel safe and talk about it so that you don't always have to carry that low by yourself. You know, I think there's like, there's power in being vulnerable and owning your story because then you give people permission to own their own, you know? And Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you don't realize that you're feeling a certain way until somebody says, hey, I went through this, you know? I've survived this and this is how I did it. And until you see yourself reflected in that story, it doesn't click and then you don't really like, you know? Sometimes you're like, oh, that's similar to my story. Like maybe I could learn something from them, you know? So if anything, I think I just want to be a little bit of a guiding light out of the darkness because we're all in it, you know? Um, some days I need people to refill my light, you know? Like I'm act, I actively fight this all the time, you know? Like I still get depressed, um, you know? There are days when <laughs> it's so hard to get out of bed, you know? But um, yeah, but I think once you find yourself a sense of pride again and the mission, you know? And I can, and then, and then this is hard because not everyone has it, but if you surround yourself with a, with a supportive tribe, like I, family is huge to me, you know? Yeah. Um, I feel like if it wasn't for my husband, my kids, my, my parents and my sisters, like things would be different for me, you know? But like, I have a very supportive tribe. So I want people to be able to have that yeah, in absolutely. me if they don't have it, you know? Mm-hmm. 
I, I love like I, everything you're saying is really comes back to being very emotional, intelligent, and it takes time and a lot of time and some practice to get to that place. And especially for us that hold it in more than letting it out, it, it takes a while to get to that place. But something you said was this vulnerability piece, which really speaks to me and I think speaks really to the women veteran community because there's so much pride and there's so much, um, you know, always sucking it up and figuring out how to solve the problem on our own that I think that really resonates with our listeners. And Brene Brown said it so beautifully. I was deployed actually when I listened to this TED talk of hers when she spoke about vulnerability and I had no idea who she was. I had no idea like she was this mega star in this healing world, right? But she said, vulnerability is not only the place where there's fear and there's sorrow, but vulnerability can also be the place of joy and happiness. And you won't know that unless you go there. Um, and so I just loved that. And that spoke so much to me because I'm like, nobody can see my weakness. Nobody can see that I'm struggling because then I'm weak and I'm always going to be perceived as weak. And, and that's not true. Like being able to open up and share that, you know, I've struggled with depression. I have areas in my life, there's trauma. So there's definitely post-trauma things that have transpired and carried over into future relationships and into my life. And once I spoke about it though, it was like so freeing and so liberating. And then to be able to help somebody else who also felt alone in that, there's just so much strength and joy coming from sharing those traumas and that story and that vulnerability. And so I think, you know, it does come with age We're we're on the other, we're, you know, I'm pushing almost 40. I don't know how old you are. And it does come as you mature and become more comfortable in your, in your walk, in your person. And so to speak life though, to somebody who's maybe 10 years behind us, 15 years behind us, what could you, what advice could you say to them to maybe start their journey of being emotionally intelligent? <sighs> okay. So I think like you said, life teaches you emotional intelligence you know like I agree with you I, I've turned 40 this year and I am being able to like understand my emotionality better because I'm able to sit in it and digest everything and dissect everything you know like when I was younger um I was very hot-headed I was very like you know like we gotta do this now or like very reactive you know I was very reactive I was reacting to the world to everything that happened it's like why is this happening to me and like I you know I would just launch back at them um I think and this is what I, I try to teach my kids now you know like especially my twins um things are gonna happen to you they're gonna make you mad or they're gonna make you want to react but like just take a time to sit down and understand how you're feeling, you know, like sit in the feelings, like, why am I feeling like this? You know, am I reacting to, to something that is trying to teach me something, you know, a lot of times we are so sensitive and, and always on defensive mode, you know, like, well, this is happening because this is that, but what part are you playing in it? You know, like what, what's your, your your role in this part of life like maybe if you shift a few degrees the other way things will flow differently you know so being able to just sit down and like think about all of these things I think have made a huge difference for me you know I've I'm, I've always been a thinker but now I feel like I've gotten better at recognizing when I'm taking the feelings off someone else on myself and which are my own, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that is one of the big keys of, of, you know, not being emotionally reactive. Yeah, for sure. And that's huge too, for I, a lesson I have learned. It's like, okay, they're feeling this away and they're putting it off on me. And I'm not, right. like, there's, that's what boundaries there's the, the boundaries are really important. And I don't think I really even grasped the whole concept of boundaries until like four years ago. So, I mean, yeah. we're not that, I'm not saying like we've arrived and we've got it all figured out, but there's still always room for growth. But I think it's really important to ask the, why am I feeling this way? And then realize what, 
they're feeling too, to realize, okay, this is just a misguided thing or I messed up. I think that's right. really hard for people to say too, is to own when you mess up, it's okay. It is okay to say I messed up and go ask for forgiveness, humble yourself a little bit, because that's going to, instead of like, um, build the can it, canyon, like keep digging that hole between the two, it's going to build a bridge and it's going to help your yeah. relationships, um, be less tumultuous, you know, as you grow. Exactly. Totally. Exactly. So is there yeah, that, anything? go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say, yeah, like that, the whole pride thing you said, you know, definitely like I, I, I still do. And I, and I own is I still have a very hard time saying, I'm sorry when I mess up, you know, and <laughs> we are I the think, same woman. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is one of the biggest lessons of my life and I'm getting better at it, but every day I struggle and I'm like, Oh, okay. You know, so. See, I, I sometimes sit and think and, and say it out loud, like not to, to the person be like, I need to go do this. Okay. I know I'm feeling it. I know that I need to go make this right. And then it's like, you get back in front of them and you're like, oh, you say yep. like it choke. Yeah. You choke up. You're like, there's like all of a sudden the words can't come and you're like, uh, uh, never mind. I'm not ready yep. to talk to you and you go back. It's funny, but yeah, that, the pride man. It get you. Yeah. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you would like to express? Mm. No, I mean, no, I think, you know, just, just people be, be, be true to your heart. Like, you know, I think we were always trying to fit ourselves into what people think we should be doing, you know, like the narrative of you should be at this point of your life or, you know, oh, you're 40 and you haven't done this yet. Like, you know, everything happens at the time that it's supposed to happen. So mm-hmm. just, you know, I always say, like, listen to your heart. I know it sounds like weird, but like you're, you're that little inner voice that tells you like, hey, I would be really happy doing this. Like, go for it, you know, because mm-hmm. life is short, man. Like, you just have to try to make it the best you can while you're here, you know? Yeah. I like that. I like how you said um, to fit this, whatever other people are wanting you to be. But if you, you can strive, but you won't find the happiness if you're only trying to make other people happy and not yourself. So you yeah. really have to evaluate that as well. Well, Maria, I'm really excited that we were able to sit down and talk today. And I just, I finished all of my conversations with three final questions and they're just the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, that's what I want you to say. So the very first one is what is there a Bible verse or story that comes up, keeps coming up in your life that, um, helps you through things? Yeah. So one of the stories that always, uh, has a, a, a emotional attachment to me, I think is the prodigal son. Cause like I said, I feel like I've, I've, and many times I've messed up in my life, you know, and I'm still surrounded by so much love. And that to me, it's like, it makes life worth it, you know? And it, it makes me feel like it's okay, like to say, I'm sorry, you know, and, and just, but then you have to be actively present to rechange the course of your life. And you just can't keep, you know, betting on that. They're going to keep loving you when you're making mistakes, you know, it's like own your story and then change the narrative, you know? Yeah. What I love about the prodigal son is that it doesn't matter how far gone you think you are. Mm -hmm. God is always there when you're ready to come home. And that is so important because again, this life is a journey and timing is everything. And it could be the last two months of your life where you, where you get your story right, or it could be from the very beginning, but God is always there to welcome you home. He wants a relationship with us and he's calling us to that. And he, but he also gives us free will to go figure it out so that when we come home, we're coming home, you know? And I just, I love that story too. There's a really good, it's called prodigal God, um, Tim Keller Bible study that I, a book, um, that I did while I was deployed actually too. And that was really eye opening for a different take on that story too. Um, so good, good story. What about a book that you've read that you would recommend our listeners to read? So my favorite book is the alchemist. 
Um, just read that twice. Somebody oh else recommended it and I read it twice. It's so good. Yes. Keep going. Why? Yeah. So because it's so first it's, it's easily digestible, you know, and the story is so captivating and I don't know, like I've always had this attachment to the, the desert, even when I was in Iraq, like I was like, I'm, I'm supposed to be here. It was, it was the weirdest thing ever, but, um, but I like that it urges you to listen to the voice of your heart, you know, like, like I said, like there's so many things that people are expecting you to do because of your plight in life, your, you know, or whatever it may be. But unless you really listen to that voice inside that makes you like, it motivates you every morning. Like when you wake up in the morning, you're like, this is what I want to do. That's your, the, the thing you should follow, you know? And I think that's why this book is so like touching for me because I'm always having to like shut out all the noise around me and really go inward and listen to that voice. And like, what do you want to do? What is making you happy? You know? What can you do to make yourself happy so that you can make everyone around you, you know, happy? So, yeah, it's interesting. You say like you felt like you were supposed to be there. My, in my deployment, I was like, I called it my walk through the desert. It was like a literal and figurative, figurative journey for me. And it really has shaped uh, who I am today because of that time. So, um, it's that wandering of us, I think maybe our soul is wandering, um, and then what about advice for a young woman, even in these uncertain times of whether we're going to change military culture or not, what advice would you tell a young woman who feels in her heart to answer that call to service? What would you say to her? Oh, I have two girls. <laughs> um, you know, I think own it, you know, own your strength, own your pride, be as feminine as you want to be, but you can still have strength. Like don't, you know, the sem- like don't break one from the other, you know, like you could be a strong leader and still be very feminine. You don't have to cut off the woman from, you know, the military person, you know? Um, I think I had that. I had, I had to learn that later in life, but, um, yeah, like just own own your strength. Don't try to mold yourself into something that they expect you to be. Just be your own. Yeah, <laughs> your own strength. Yeah, that's good. Well, I appreciate you so very much and I applaud the work you're doing. And as soon as this COVID pandemic is over, I am standing with you in celebration that your organization is going to do some amazing things in the healing realm of veterans. And I just really am thankful for you answering that call on your life. So thank you so much for joining me today and doing what you're doing. Oh, no, of course. Thank you so much for having me. And yeah, hopefully, you know, this is this is the, the, the beginning of, of bigger things. I really feel like, you know, there's a calling for me to help other veterans, even, even on social media, you know, just me like telling people, hey, create this stuff. And like, I've had all these messages like, hey, you, you 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 inspire me to get back to sculpting or you inspire me to get back to painting and that to me is like this is why i'm doing it you know because i want to spark that light in other people to have a creative medium you know so if you loved this conversation i have some great news for you freedom sisters is now on youtube some more ways to connect with us be inspired and truly learn a new perspective from women veterans who have served this country. So join us, subscribe and hit that bell. So you never miss a really amazing episode. Thanks y'all.